two o'clock, so let's get started. So we are PowerShell developers. We write code, we write integrations, automations, scripts, or any other programs. So as long as we are within our CLI backend cave, we are pretty happy there. But when, say, our manager will come to us and ask, can we actually do something interactive? Can we make something that actually normal users who you don't, you know, don't know PowerShell can actually use that application, then there's a problem. Because we usually need some sort of application, either local application or web application. So that's where what I'm going to talk to about is coming in action. I'm going to talk about a module called Pod, which allows us to run PowerShell web server and also write a front-end on PowerShell. But before we start, let's thanks to our sponsors, Pash My PC and Chocolatey, for letting this thing happen, that we can gather here together and talk to each other and learn. A few words about myself. My name is Kamil Protishin. I work for Mod McDonald as IT developer or DevOps engineer. If you've seen me online, probably that was on my YouTube channel where I put a lot of PowerShell videos where I like to break down things, like get them to the core. I've also created a course for PowerShell for IT professionals. The inspiration really came from the book of Don Jones, PowerShell in Month of Lunches, but I wanted to allow to do it in video. So my way of getting it back. The idea is you don't know how to code, how to write PowerShell, you'll be able to write scripts, use pipeline, things like that. And I've been PowerShell fanatic since 2017 when, if you happen to be in Fujitsu when Jeffrey Snover and Stephen Murawski were in the town, that was the night when I got converted and I just, well, I just decided PowerShell is my next thing. That's what I want to do. Okay, enough, enough about myself. Everything what you're going to see today will be PowerShell only. No CSS, no HTML, no JavaScript, no Python, no what's not. PowerShell only. So there are two modules we're going to talk to, I will show you today. First one is called Pote. It's been written by Mr. Matthew Kelly, or his GitHub is Pajarati. And Pote is the actual backend. That's where all the API happens. That's where the workload is. The second module is called Pote.web. So it's, it requires Pote to work. And this is what allows, allows us to write front-end, our web pages. So that's what you access through the web browser. PowerShell is cross-platform, cross -platform. Pod is cross-platform. That means you can run it on Windows PowerShell, on PowerShell Core. You can run it on the server or in the, or in the cloud. You can run it on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, or container. Pick your poison. And the best part is it is free and open source. So there's nothing stopping you from using your apart from your legal department or security department. All right, that's it. Let's get into demos. So what I prepared, because my goal, although we probably will be able to write pod pages after that, is to spread awareness that actually there is PowerShell web server, and you don't need to look for any other third part tool. So I will have several examples for you today, and I hope that you'll be able to relate some of them or just actually find the use case. So how do we start with pod? As we can see, that's my beginning of the very simple server, as I call it. And all I do here is loading my supporting libraries. And then as we can see, pod and pod.web are just standard PowerShell modules. So you can go install module pod, comma, pod.web, and it will install that for you from the PowerShell gallery. So how do we start our server? From the command let called start pod server, for the, because this is live session and we have very limited time and I don't want to waste your time, I made everything as simple as possible. Everything runs locally on this machine. There's no database, there are just JSON files. I just, I know when we go, when something's supposed to, when my something might go down, it will go down. So I don't want to let you down. That's why I'm, you know, saving this from the local host. 
At the very end of the session, I will give you a link of actually port running in Docker right now. So be able to play with the same application I'll be showing you now. So what are we doing? I'm specifying the obviously address, which is localhost, that could be binding to any IP address or domain name. My port, my protocol, HTTP, is obviously HTTPS is supported with certificate as well. If I like to, well, obviously it's securely. Uh, we port also has a baked-in mechanism for logging, so we can log our errors, requests. It will take care of putting that in the files, putting dates on them, and rotating the files. So it's quite nifty. Now, obviously every application needs a hello world. So we're starting with obviously simple endpoint or route hello. So uh, route is just simply when you have your web address forward slash your endpoint. So we're just simply calling hello, and then we will respond with message hello world. So I pick, I've put in that val values before we started, so you don't need to look at me just pressing enter effectively. So let's call it, and that's our hello world. Server is running here on the separate terminal window, so you don't need to think like I'm, you know, I'm just returning simple JSON. Uh, but okay, obviously that's one. Now when I look around, because I, I, I am around Reddit and Discord quite a lot, I constantly see people asking, oh, I have Active Directory, how can I query users? How can I ask people to query users? It's just users seems to be the thing that is very popular. And that makes sense, or prey on so, so, sorts of data. So what I have, I have a simple JSON file that kind of mimics what we will have in AD with a couple of users, just some basic fields. So what another path will do called users, if I don't specify any parameters, any query, so when you do a question mark, my query name, it will return all of them. If I will specify ask for specific user, in that case, it will then return me that specific user. So where is my examples? So first of all, all the users. That's my two users. And now I will go for the query pointer of username single user. I could obviously also do post and post JSON file, if that would be the thing. And I got one more. Quite often, I mean, I'm not API developer, but I've seen that when a user has an ID or object has certain ID, I can go query my endpoint forward slash the actual ID of the user. I don't even know how it's actually properly called, but that's the thing. So we've got the same thing here. So we call users, and as we can see here, colon user ID. So port server will know back on the back end that I'm actually querying spe uh, on that endpoint. So we have uh, asking for user number two. We have user number two. That's okay. That's back end. And although it is kind of cool to have the ability to do this on the server, with things like Azure functions or Lambda functions, we could really do that for a while, to just have a PowerShell endpoint. So suddenly I take my scripts, put them in the cloud, I have my data. So I think the real power of pod, or really where it adds value, is when we start writing front-end, when we declare our front-end in PowerShell. So let's get to the actual front-end part, which is, I think, fun. So what I'm going to do with it? First of all, I need to save some files. So I will save files from the folder called static, where images will be, and then log stream will actually I'll be doing the live log streaming of, of the server from the log files. I will tell it that I want to use port web templates. This is actually what loads the, the front end. Port by default has three themes, light, dark, and console. Because it's presentation, I think it's easier just to see it on light. And we will have certain links at the top where you can actually find more information about Pod. And use Pod web pages. We simply load everything from folder called pages. Okay, let's see the actual page on GitHub. <laughs> for GitHub on the, on the laptop. So this is our 
home so this is our home page and now how is it, how is it declared well actually what Paul gives us by default like I don't configure anything we have that sidebar with all the pages we can see there we can filter through them we can drop that sidebar we can we have that links I've mentioned before so it's just it's just there by default and as we can see it's powered by love with a height sign now is it is this text visible can you see the source code clearly yes because I figured it will be a nicer experience for you to actually have a source code on the page rather than me keep flicking between VS code and pages so if it's clearly visible awesome so port home page is a special page which is home if you don't specify a home page it will just pick the first alphabetical page being your home page as you can see we're creating that new port web hero and here is just this thing that's the name I yeah it's just how it's called this element is called I'm not invite I didn't well nobody asked me how this should be called and we can see it takes an array of what I'm putting layouts inside all the elements I put inside of it and then I have another container where I put images my image so container is not needed but it just allows port to nicely group things together so it looks nice on HTML site behind the scenes if you look for the source code there's actually HTML sitting behind the scenes but okay we are visual creatures and we like to see things so for example Charles I have my server you know with certain stats maybe some data science so we can draw Charles this just generates random numbers between 0 and 10 and just throw them into Charles but as you can see it's also dynamic how many lines of code very few so this is a really standard pattern we see when we build port pages we start with add port page the name which will then become an ID but in the backend so if I like to reference it with other tool or the commandlet I can do it that way I can actually specify my own backend name which I will then reference in that reference in that page by and there's script blocks there's a lot of script blocks yeah so when we see that squiggly bracket we see straight away anonymous function so Paul does a lot of script blocks it's just all over the place there so when we have uh, our page our script block so we see Paul then starts to process that page and that's our child so it's again baked in function which then runs a script block which returns our child and yeah the card there will be always the card at the bottom with source which pulls that source code for this page dynamically so that's our one example uh, processes so it's really because PowerShell is cross-platform and I really wanted to make this cross-platform presentation so that you can just go pull it from github run and well and just learn something and I found my favorite command that which I always use on all the examples get service doesn't exist outside Windows but apparently get processed us so what do we have here we have actually this is coming live from this laptop all the processes I run with the amount of CPU they use and then amount of memory that process uses so you can see PowerPoint is quite memory hungry here interesting what does it take to create it obviously you get a, again our web page we have our script block we have our container where I put my child and now notice here is this beautiful I would say classic PowerShell writing like that was in that Don Jones book I don't rewrite that PowerShell anymore just piping piping selecting sorting blah but this is normal PowerShell we write nice with a select object doing expression here and then we have a dedicated port commandlet which will take that output from this command and then convert it into the child we can see okay so we've seen that user example before on the back end so obviously we find and there will be a lot of forms that apparently the best way to gather information from users is by the form so there'll be a lot of forms but as we had before the back end for the getting user now we have actual page so okay yeah user comes whatever submit I can validate yeah so I can validate I can actually point you out which field needs information or which information 
is wrong. As you can see, I can have, you know, I have this interaction with the user very easily for the web page. Because they see, oh yeah, you, ca you didn't find it. If I create some that's actually found, and then it then gives me back the information we've seen earlier on the API endpoint. So what we do here, obviously page with a script block, and then we create a form. Form takes two main, requires two parameters. Content, which is an array of pod elements. An element can be anything. It could be a text box, it could be a se select like a drop down, so anything you can put in, that's your content. And then there's script block. So what happens? When you create a form, pod by default gives us this submit button. It's just there waiting for us. The moment you press that submit button, it serializes everything what we have in content. So every, co every property will become an object on the PowerShell end. And that pow and then object will be then executed through script block. So what we can see here, for example, what I've done, I'm displaying the information on the user. So on the front end, it's, it's called username. On the text box, it's called USR. So what we can see when I serialize this, I then pulled has a special variable called web event. All the information Paul holds is in, is in that variable. That data, and that pretty much that's hash table, the name of my property from the content is available there. And at this point, I can run certain validation like we've seen. Yeah? So if it's empty string, then we just prompt user that it can't be empty, and we do early return. Nothing else to do. When it doesn't find user, yeah, cool, all of this, all of the differently. When it doesn't find user, we just tell you is it not found. Otherwise, because I didn't really find a way to pass in objects between pages. I think it's in the making. So what I do, uh, I call the same page. I move move pod web page, which is called find user, which we find from the source code is actually the page. So I'm just reloading the page, and I'm passing in that username to that page again. So I'm just loading it again in the query string. And then when I do that, so we have web event, it effectively does query. So, you know, question mark. When there's actually that is being passed, it will then create all that fields we've seen earlier, I mean, higher on the page. I'm not sure if it's the most efficient way, but it works. In some example, I've had 500 users on four core Azure VM, and it worked. It didn't die. So just to give you an idea about how this how it is performed, I didn't really measure it properly, but 500 users is was good enough for me. Right. So I mentioned log streaming. So I have baked in log streaming. So that's pretty much all the days when I was playing with this application, when I was developing it. We just need to give it a couple of seconds to pull the file and then stream it here. So when you have a when you have a need to expose certain log files to your users, but you don't really need them to log into the server, you don't want to then to actually log in the poke around. You can just expose that. That's how you can read the logs. This one will actually keep refreshing. So we, we'll cook, we'll, this, this particular element will keep refreshing itself every few seconds. And as we can see, that's quite a lot. So what's there? Again, because I'm doing this cross-platform, I couldn't just give you a blank path. I had to use join path, which apparently takes care of but forward slashes, backslashes. It's an amazing thing when you stop writing PowerShell for Windows, how many things actually are just there. So I'm grabbing the path for the logs, and I'm just pulling the names of the files. And I'm, I'm doing on the form, so yet another form, as we can see, different element called select. So select is this drop down. So that's the names of, that's the names of my files. And then when you are picking the user, it will 
again, reload the page with the file name I want. And this is, it was just me while debugging. So this is the way how I can output information to the console while I'm actually seeing what's going on on the server at the backend. I could probably get rid of it before coming. Uh, but anyways, it should be actually, there, there we go. That's, that's the file I picked, it's there. As you can see, there. So it definitely did load it. Okay. And then we just use baked in commandlet web file stream where I tell it which file to pull, which comes from my drop down list. I'm like, I for the first time approached Paul, found it, found, found out about it around September when I was looking for a way to create web applications. And there was literally that one comment on Reddit, have you checked Pod? What is Pod? Well, it's amazing. Okay. Now, this is slightly more complex example, which I was actually building while on YouTube, just to show what we can do. So it's actually should be called password sharing, thinking about this now. So what this allows me to do is generate a password and then send it to PW Push. PW Push is a website which allows you to share passwords. So what it does, you will, this is my password, it will generate you a unique link for that password, and that unique link is valid for X amount of days of views. When it expires, the link dies, and it's useless. So it's a very convenient way of sending passwords or any other secure information to the end users. So what we can do with it? We can specify how long our password is going to be. We can specify wh what sort of characters we want because obviously not all pages, not all providers support longer passwords or you know weird characters, etc. So I can generate it. And now if the internet is working, we should get a password link. There we go. That's the password link. So if I would go there, it will give me there. So it definitely did talk to API of PW push. And as we can see, it will expire. That's certain values I just have baked in there. So pretty simple. What did it take to build this? Because this one is slightly more complex. Another page, another script block another container, another form. So we, I think we can start seeing the pattern here. At least maybe that's just my use cases for this. So we had a, you know, we've seen that slider at the top. That's our range. And we can specify minimum, maximum, and then default value for this one. The checkbox, so we've seen this. For the user, we've seen capital A, capital Z, digits, bunch of weird characters. But actually on the back end, what I'm doing, I'm calling them slightly different. So I can expose again something for the user that is user friendly. On the back end, maybe because the module I'm using requires that name of parameters, maybe I just prefer having this that way. So I can absolutely do it. So it's very simple. It takes the array of op display options, array of options, and it just takes the index and matches it on the back end. We have a few text boxes. One of them is on read only. So if you look at the I cannot change it. The, what, the link, I cannot change it. Why would I be able to, that, to do that? And, oh, I'm sorry, I lied to you. I told you there will be PowerShell only. There's apparently one hash of CSS. I'm, I'm gosh, I lied. Okay. Yes, uh, the reason why there's CSS is that, because we, we have by default two buttons, submit and reset. I wanted to have my own button, which will allow me to generate password. So as you can see, it is part of the form, but probably because of some implementation, how it's done in the backend, it was slightly higher. So effectively, I, with my absolute lack of knowledge and five minutes of deep Google research, I figured out this CSS style will allow me to level it, which it does. So we can also drop in our CSS in place if you want to. And then again, obviously, we can validate whether user provided some information or not. Actually, here I'm doing this properly through .NET classes, not like before. 
And then when I call that button, so as we can see that button, yeah, it's slightly complex, but when we look at this button, the script block, it will then go, use the function which as I have attached here to grab the password and then output web text box is what made this field to be replaced. So I can actually dynamically update box, uh, text boxes values in them if I'd like to. And that's pretty much what we want here. Also on this single page, because again, I treat it more like a learning exercise than real application, I just put all the supporting functions on the same file. You can absolutely have your functions spread in other places, but because PowerShell doesn't really follow it, it makes it slightly easier to just have it everything in one page, all consigned, so you can see exactly which function comes from what it does if you're interested. Okay, we have this. Now, how are we looking with time? 26, fine. So this is very standard form where use, we just ask some questions to the user. They will submit that information and you can, again, fill a form. This is how object looks at the backend. So this, is, this looks like hash table based on the property names. And that form, it's there, but I think you can achieve some, that level of form with third party tools fairly easy. There's nothing special about it because user logs in, so they have the email, so yes. So that form, I think we can skip, but I have slightly more advanced example. So imagine scenario, you run, you, you, you keep an inventory of the software of your state, of your computers. And then you're finding that there are some users that have some really old versions of software. So you can either really uninstall that versions of software or upgrade them. Now, with the simple form, like if you're going for the third party solution, I don't think you can really preload that data. Right, maybe there is some tool I'm not aware of, but preloading data, yeah, let's say it's in SQL somewhere, I need to preload that data. So when I log in, I want to see my machines, I want to see my pieces of software, and the answer, I want that user's answers. So I think that's when really this combination of PowerShell, some SQL, or any other data storage, and pod really starts to shine. So you see we have that one, and let's say, I don't know, I want to do something about Java, so I'll give my answer, I can say what we do, and some comment. Yeah, so this is then, once we have it, in PowerShell, in SQL, it's fairly straightforward. So how, do, how is this implemented? Because this one is slightly more complex. Come on, zoom in. Why won't you zoom in when I want you to zoom in? Yeah. So simple function, get computers that just returns an array of objects, which we've seen, new page, and now script block. Now notice that what really is going on here, I'm really writing PowerShell. There's no much port at this point yet. I pulled some data, I then, I then look through the, from that data, and I create card. So I have my computers, and now I dynamically based on that computers, I will create card for each computer. So we have two computers, and we have two cards. And card has this, bio, uh, this feature that you can Jack and drop it, I mean drop it. So dynamically created, pull from database somewhere. And then for each of the software that is attached to these computers, I can actually create a table, table dynamically. So, effect, so that was created on spot. We didn't have it before, we just pulled that information and then Paul, Paul did show this for us. Also notice that little batch. So there's an element called batch, which allows me to make things, give them a color, give them a name. So it's a bit more visual to the user. What else is going on here? So that's where we establish our batch colors. But there's this one column called payload. And that payload is nowhere to be seen. But if I click edit, he created that, that's my payload, value equals mach machine to pipe to. 
So how did it come to be? How does it work? When I create table, I can t tell Paul that I want this particular column to be hidden. So I can hide, I can store information, I can hide information for the user. So they don't see it, but it's there. It could be, for example, the email address. So they authenticate for Azure AD, you have the email address, you can keep it there. Hide it. You don't, they don't need to see the email address. They know it by heart, probably. And then when we get, when we are having our payload, the edit button is again dynamically created here because we have a script block, which will then take me to the second page, which is hidden. We can't see it on the left-hand side, and we'll pass in my payload. And then the second page was just standard, standard report page with the only thing is, because again, I didn't figure out, I don't know if it's possible to pass in objects, so effectively my payload is just a string with computer name and software ID, which I'll then split and decode it. So effectively, I can actually go and query something on the database or on any other source. source. So what else we have? Because we are, I'm actually ra rushing this today. So some extra information, if you are interested in Pult. We have a Discord, and Discord is active, so you very, very often get the answer to your problem on the same day. Matthew Kelly, who is the, who started this whole project, is active there. I am there, and lately, well, more and more people. GitHub, you can absolutely do pull requests. I did pull few pull requests myself to fix things, to improve things, to bring new things to Pult. Documentation, it has really nicely written documentation for Pult and Pult.web. So that's actually how I started to learn about it. The moment when I found about Pult, I had something actually meaningful working in a matter of a few hours, which is a lot. I mean, a lot. Very quick, I mean, a lot of value. With, well, I knew PowerShell, and that apparently paid off. Uh, obviously, authentication. So by, out of the box, Pult supports this kind of authentication to itself. So you can possibly find something that works for you. There's also generic OAuth tool if you want to implement something that is not supported by default. Uh, to build Docker container, that's literally what I have in here, is just simple PowerShell image, copy and everything, expose port, and then just run it. And we have very basic Docker image running. It's also user mobile friendly, but because I have this running, unless it died by now, let's, we will find out in a moment, it automatically adjusts itself to your mobile phone, so it's responsive. So you can drive this yourself. Let's try. Source code is available on my GitHub. So everything what you've seen here, the slides, is there. You can just go pull it, run it, it will run, because pod is attached, you don't need to install any modules. So that should, well, I hope that should make it as easy. I did test it on this Mac, I tested it on Windows. It works. It, it, I did, and let's see if container still works, because maybe it doesn't work anymore. There we go. This is pulled on container on Azure Web Services. So I think there are three replicas going, and well, let's see, it's still working. So again, uh, Pod is open source. I am not a salesman. I'm not trying to sell it or push it to you. I just want to raise awareness of you that there is PowerShell web server. By knowing PowerShell, knowing how to write PowerShell function, you can write web pages. This is all I have for you for today. Do we have any questions? Although I might be not able to answer, because each I found about this product six months ago. <laughs> yes. On the time uh, tables. So the question was on the tables. So I think you're talking about the advanced. This one. So what? I mean, I know you can do them in order. I know you can pass in the information, we'll keep them nicely aligned. 
I didn't do it because I didn't. But to keep them in order, when you create your hash table, you can pass in a parameter of ordered. I mean, no, it's not fine. It's actually ordered hash table. So in that case, you will always return your columns in that order. By the question was more about sorting data within the table. So is it a table? Ah, I see. So so, so if there was a sort button, I genuinely don't know. Uh, we could possibly, if if it's not supported on pod itself, I would then just grab it on PowerShell sort on PowerShell object and then output to table. But honestly, I don't know if that filters are there. So can can answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. Any other questions? So what I've used so far, I've used Azure AD. So what you end up doing is create an app, register application on Azure AD. So you get your app, uh, client ID, your secret or site, your tenant ID. There's uh, when you create authentication, there's something called at port of scheme. So you say that you want Azure AD. That's my values. And at this point, you can really apply it to all your pages. So you go there, in order, if you, let's say, have single sign-on going, you will just do single sign-on, user doesn't even see that single sign-on sign -on happening. If you don't, obviously, they'll be prompted for the password. Uh, you can also specify it, limit it only to specific pages. Yeah, but it's just prompt, so like, how is the back end of this? Uh, like, how would you live in the script block? How would you know who's connected? For this, we really ended up, for this, we ended up writing our own validation. Uh, we didn't approach it from that point of view. So, again. <laughs> Any other questions? Golden silence. Okay. Are there any extensions yeah. for that? Like, uh, because I know that uh, I was working mainly with Spark Universal before, mm -hmm. and they have the, 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 the shop where you can just, just get some additional, like, new class and stuff like this. Does, does, does this one have something similar? Some library of uh, mm, no. extensions? No. Not I know. So at the moment, you can only get the, the source code and then just play with source code. I, I don't think it's at that level. For project, it's been... I think it's been two, two, year, two years on the market. And to a certain level, it was single person's effort. So I don't think it's there. It might be in the pipe, but I don't think it is. Okay. Again, if you get on Discord, Matthew will be definitely able to tell you more. Because I often, I was preparing this, I was asking him questions, and he could actually tell me something that is, I don't know if it's maybe not documented, but he, you know, he just knows it because he wrote it. So. I think it's the kind of project that is, at the moment, ye kind of young and is getting traction of people coming and actually asking questions and then, hmm, we didn't think about that use case yet. So, But again, to lift something up off the ground quickly, it, it honestly saved, saved us at some point. <laughs> Have you got the link to the Discord? Uh, I can click that link. Let me ask, give me a second. Uh, do, 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 do. What is test yourself? No, extra info. Discord. Let me like. How can I make it? Let's go. Mouse. Is it big enough? Yeah. If you go. GitHub, github.com slash pod, no, bajarati.pod, it's there also, directly on GitHub. Yes, the moment when you use pod web template, that's, that's what's cool. given to you. You can hide that sidebar on the page, but that's pretty much, it's just. And I've seen that there's uh, parameters for icons to use to 
Yes. Yes, uh, so it's using material icons. It's somewhere in documentation, the actual page they use. So you just then pass in the names of it and it pulls the icons. All right, thank you for your time. <laughs>